And then you go into the uh, cellular store, like this gentleman did, and, and uh, uh, it is the consumer who should make the decisions. When our uh, industry matures, and it's going to happen, Tom, it's going to take a while, it's going to, we need a little more competition, WiMAX will, will do that, the applications are going to be what the issues are. And that's where the unlocked phones become important. When, when we stop focusing on the devices and we stop trying to make the devices universal, because you know that uh, universal devices that purport to do all things for all people, they don't do any of them very well. But I have a vision of the future with specialized devices, specialized services focused on what people need, and lots of individual competitive businesses. So it's going to be, of course, the, regulator, the regulators are important. And of course, the manufacturers have to build this stuff. But understanding the needs of the people and delivering an application to serve those needs is, is what I think the revolution is. And that's why when I talked about all this technology and mass and all that stuff, the real focus is low-cost broadband. To get it low enough, then people, uh, entrepreneurs, were able to come in and get access to that broadband and offer us applications that are going to change our lives. Yes, sir. My, my question goes back to the European-U.S. Uh, comparison. Uh, one of the factors was uh, arguably that Europe adopted calling party pays uh, earlier and on a more widespread basis. What I'm trying to understand is, was our coming late to calling party pays, and when we came to it, doing it more incrementally, was that a technological factor, or was it essentially a billing and economic factor? Is there a, was there a technological aspect to that? that you know, I'm, I'm not expert at that. I'll give you an opinion. Uh, it was an inertial. We started out that way. And we, we had a... We started uh, out with the car phones were... We started out with the, uh, with the receiver, receiving person pays for the, uh, for the call. Uh, we, the one uh, huge difference between uh, the U.S. and all the European uh, countries is the fact that our whole allocation process was one geography at a time. Lots of small companies ended up ultimately coalescing. Uh, we still have a lot more competition in, in uh, many uh, European countries. Uh, but, uh, they have more adoption. But, and, and arguably, I mean, they reached, they reached higher adoption levels with arguably a more fragmented system because they got, in, in less than the space of the United States, they've got all kinds of individual countries. And despite some attempts at regulatory harmonization by Brussels, it's still been licensing at the country level and auctions in some cases and not in others. And so from I, I, that I, standpoint, they've had a fairly fragmented framework, and yet um, the industry has pushed using a single standard, um, pushed, and, and you have 30% or 40% higher adoption of, uh, of, of cell phones per capita. Well, I, uh, in the spirit that, uh, that Tom just said, uh, I might suggest that you uh, are not exactly right. <laughs> it just, but it's, once again, this is an opinion. Uh, but I, where did you get the feeling like deeper penetration means that people are ahead of you? The, the, uh, if you want to look at, at uh, relative penetration of wired versus wireless, go to China or someplace like that. It turns out that, uh, that the worse the wireline system is, the higher the adoption of wireless. Uh, 450 million wireless and has about 400 uh, wire line connections. It, it has gone a dual track system, unlike the, there are other developing countries where they've gone wireless and have. Good, I, I hope you'll it. help me and but, pick a better, pick a a better example. Yeah. But I think if you go to, to that, uh, undeveloped countries will leapfrog, yes. and, and so you won't argue with that. But thank you for that information about China. And I just came back from China and I never. Found that out. Shame on me. Yeah, which makes it amazing. I mean, they, they built out, you know, 750 million uh, combination lines within an extremely short period of time. Yes. But wireless is still growing much but, faster. But their penetration rate is lower than Latin America's, which you could argue is a relatively similar uh, level uh, economically. 
uh, and Latin America, and, and you could argue that that's partly because Latin America has a fragmented political geography, and that you actually get higher uh, adoption levels when you have different smaller units making these decisions, smaller management units in the industry, knowing what the local conditions are, and, and deploying uh, within those conditions and with a better marketing focus. So, I mean, these are interesting I, 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 issues. I, I, those but, are valuable insights, but uh, uh, just to. I may not close it off, but uh, uh, think about the fact of what, what is the greatest benefit of wireless? It, it is improving productivity. And is there any evidence that the Europeans have? Uh, <laughs> oh, you know, yes, sir. About eight or ten years ago, I saw a very fascinating demonstration of self configuring networks where individual phones were both trans uh, transmitters and receivers. And the benefit of that was that you could have much lower power devices and you didn't have to set up cell towers. You'd basically have an internet type system where my phone would send a signal to your phone, which would send a signal to the next phone, and it would kind of route my call to whoever I needed it to get to. I haven't heard much since then. Yep. Is, this, is this something that only the military was willing we're, to pay for? We're, we're getting there, one step at a time. Peter is sitting there uh, working on uh, his company, working on cognitive radio. I'm working on a multi-antenna system. I didn't mention to you, I didn't want to get into technical details. One of the things that this adaptive array does is it literally redesigns the system based upon what it experiences a couple hundred times a second. It, and, and I'm not exaggerating. It, it literally looks out over there, decides who it wants to listen to, and emphasizes them, who it wants to reject, rejects them, and recalculates uh, that 200 times a second. So it's configuring. Now when you add to that uh, cognitive radio, which is, uh, without offense to Peter, just emerging now, it's at the beginning of this 20-year cycle. When you add to that, hopefully you can really self-configure uh, the whole world in, in many different ways. And that's where I came out with this dream. And this is not a new dream. I figured this out when I was still a, a young engineer. Gee was if we could only use that piece of the spectrum, frequency-wise, geographically-wise, time-wise, that we needed, there, there would be an infinite amount of spectrum available. But you've got to have something that's, that really does self-configure on a continuing basis. We don't know how to do that yet. Just self-configuring radios. These were self-configuring networks. Yeah. So every every phone was a transmitter and a receiver, a mesh. A, as a mesh network. And it, it just again, I, I heard all this buzz. Yeah. You know, well, the, eight years ago, even five years ago, and it's just kind of faded well, away. Well, it's, be, because, it was, it it's because it was it's because it was buzz. Because uh, two issues. Number one, we we don't know how to do it, yeah. and and the second one is if mesh networks are. Uh, great to talk about, but they're also uh, terribly inefficient spectrally. Every, I don't know if everybody knows what a mesh network is, but it's, it's one where uh, you can move a call from one person to another uh, on different frequencies, which means that every call, each time you do a hop like that, every call doubles the amount of spectrum you need. So, uh, sure, geographic sharing. Miles, That's what I just told you. I'm glad you listened. Yards. Anyway, people are working on that. It's one of the uh, immature technologies, but people are working on, on mesh networks. They're working on self-configuring network. They're working on cognitive radio. Uh, they are certainly doing uh, software-defined uh, radios. A lot of good technology out there, uh, and and that's why I, when I talk about uh, the 50-year uh, vision, it's, that is most certainly going to happen because these things are going to mature. And my only message today was you're going to have to wait for them to uh, mature. We got. If you had a million dollars, you might be investing in mesh technologies, or is that, is that one of the ones that's not quite as hot as. You, know, you, know, you, you want to talk about investing, you're talking to the wrong guy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Marty? Yes, sir. Uh, two years ago, the uh, Gardner Group put out a uh, report that said that the most advanced wireless broadband market in the world was Sydney, Australia. And they said that in large measure because uh, Iverse, the Raycom technology that's now marketed by Vodafone, I think, uh, among others, in the Australian market, was competing then with a, yet another uh, so-called 4G technology. Uh, and since that's, that competition has spread across Australia. But the United States doesn't have that competition. Uh, arguably, uh, 
3G is developing uh, in the U.S. because of liberal policies related to the licensing of cellular carriers, and we do have some uh, emerging on the sort of on the horizon the Clearwire efforts and so forth uh, using the 2.5 uh, gigahertz licenses. But the uh, the Gardner Group, uh, by all accounts, was correct that the most advanced market for this is in Australia. Now, the Australian regulatory structure is uh, radically different than the U.S. when it comes uh, to radio spectrum, and uh, many of us have referred to that as a liberalization there, where they have gone much more into a so-called property rights structure, and uh, they uh, regulate very loosely what can be done with spectrum. They define sort of radio spaces, and they have a liberal policy with respect to having these auctions, getting the licenses out. And uh, as many have noted, the licenses uh, that uh, were purchased, including the Arraycom license in 2001, was actually sold quite cheaply. And that's exactly what you get when you have a more liberal and uh, more of a, a, a free entry situation. So uh, given all that, why wouldn't you think that that liberalization of the so-called property rights model that the Australians have instituted would be a very substantial advance uh, for the United States uh, to, to adopt or in some way to move towards? Well, uh, uh, I, I must confess that I, uh, even after I've read all the, the papers, uh, most, <laughs> mostly yours, I don't uh, really understand it. I do understand the real world because I live in it. So let me tell you what really happened. Well, the real world's a special case. We can talk about that later. <laughs> all right, yeah, right. Uh, uh, Raycom went to Australia because Australia auctioned off some spectrum. Uh, Australia is, uh, is a relatively small continent country, 19 million pops, uh, and they auctioned off 5 megahertz of spectrum, and we bought 5 megahertz of spectrum for uh, 5 million bucks. So, uh, and, and what was the company? We were, t we're a bunch of techies. We designed software. But uh, we have been struggling for years and years to demonstrate that the smart antenna, that mass could do the things that we said. Uh, and we ended up building a system to operate in that spectrum with one objective, low cost broadband. Uh, and we did, uh, we, this is the first time I mentioned my company, by the way, this was, I, I don't usually do that, but let's shift gears and I'll start selling. <laughs> so we created uh, a system focused on one thing, get the highest possible spectral efficiency for broadband. And we created a system called iBurst. And we installed that uh, at great cost uh, in uh, Australia, formed a company to do that. Uh, and we decided we'd replicate that in the US. Well, it turns out uh, we went to the FCC. I've dealt with the FCC for many years, very competent people, and guys really trying. And I'm really sincere about that. People at, uh, at, at the Department of Commerce, the NTIA, FCC, these are people that, that study these situations and, and are trying to solve the problem. And they found, we found, five megahertz of spectrum, and they auctioned it off. And it turns out that the cost per pop was a fraction of what uh, the cost was in, uh, in Australia. Somebody else bought it. But it also took several years to make that happen. Well, you, nothing happens fast, Tom. <laughs> it does in Australia. <laughs> That's the difference. Uh, maybe. I, 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 I would, I, as I told you, I don't really understand an, enough about what the difference is between the property rights there and the auctioning off of Spectrum here. I do know that if I had done a better job, we would have a, a nationwide uh, iBurst uh, system today that would add to the competitive environment. There is iBurst in South Africa today, in a number of uh, countries of, of South Africa. Uh, but I'm very happy. The problem is going to get solved. Uh, uh, WiMAX uh, is, is got mass embedded in it. So we're going to have low cost uh, broadband. Uh, and somebody is going to find some spectrum. I, I, one of the slides I didn't uh, bring up here is uh, there was a headline in, in RCR the other day. Uh, AT&T uh, is selling a boatload of spectrum. That was the, that was, that was the exact words. Well, where's, you know, there are boatloads of spectrum being sold. What's all this talk about? We're, you know, if, if I, I repeat what I said uh, earlier. Somehow, if somebody's got persistence and they know 